fathers look away Your feet aren't too broken Your hands are quick to say Make us like you, Lord You walk with the forgotten And offer them a hope Adopting the unwanted And calling them your own Oh, give us your heart, oh, give us your heart If the light of heaven shine as we step into the dark Oh, give us your heart, oh, give us your heart All to see your kingdom come in death And offer them my home Adopting the unwanted Calling them your own Make us like you, Lord Make us like you, Lord Oh, give us your heart Oh, give us your heart Dude, Cleveland Browns. <laughs> Dude. Guys, I've gotten like 10 ridiculous emails from Charlie this week, and it's only Wednesday. Yes. Unsubscribe, please. <laughs> Have you ever met a pastor that makes you want to cuss so much? He gives us so many reasons to complain. Mm. 
I don't want this toxic anger anymore. Todd, you know how Taylor Swift never wastes a grudge? Mm. Check out this song. James 5 9 says, do not grumble or complain against one another. Ain't no man can't see me. Ain't no man can't enslave me. Ain't no man a man that can change the shape my soul is in There ain't nobody here who could cause me pain or raise my fear Cause I got only love to share If you're looking for truth I'm proof you'll find it there You gotta serve something, ain't that right? I know it gets dark, but there's always a light. Don't gotta buy in to get into the club. So trade your worries. You gotta show up if you wanna be seen. If it matters to you, ma, it matters to me. I'm gonna fall hard, yeah, I know I am. The clowns crack up, I laugh with them. Ain't no man can't save me. Ain't no man can't enslave me. Ain't no man, a man that can change the shape my soul is in. There ain't nobody here who could cause me pain or raise my fear Cause I got only love to share If you're looking for truth on proof, you'll find it there You say you look funny, I say you're a star I say you're whatever you think you are Janae says all fall right in line If you believe it, they'll say she's so pretty He's so fine. Ain't no man can save me. Ain't no man can enslave me. There ain't no man, a man that can change the shape my soul is in. There ain't nobody here who could cause me pain or raise my fear. Cause I got only love to share. If you're looking for truth on proof, you'll find it there. Got to go somewhere, ain't that right? Not a whole lot of time for me and you. Got a whole lot of reasons to be mad. Let's not pick one. I live in a room at the top of the stairs. Got my windows wide open and nobody cares. And I got no choice but to get right up when the sun breaks through. Woo! Hey, no man can't save me. There ain't no man can enslave me. There ain't no man, a man that can change the shape my soul is in. Ain't nobody here who could cause me pain or raise my fear Cause I got only love to share If you're looking for truth on proof, you'll find it there If you're looking for truth on proof, you'll find it there If you're looking for truth on proof, you'll find it
You heard from one man who said, I'm not going to be negative. I'm going to be positive in spite of my circumstances. And wow, do we need to hear that right now. Those of you who are listening, I think you're going to see this experience today is so practical. Make sure you take the opportunity to tithe back how God's blessed you to our movement. If you're a part of Southbrook in particular and you're listening to this, we want you to be engaged in your time, your treasure, and your talents. And uh, Push Pay right now is a way you can do that. So download the Push Pay app if you've never done that. To talk about today, and we are in a series, One Light, and today is Do Not Grumble Against One Another. We're in the series of One Another's in the New Testament. And to do it, to give a picture, I got to talk to you about Absalom. Now, men know this, is, but Absalom was the, the son of King David. And here's a descriptor in 2 Samuel 14, 25 of Absalom. In all Israel, there was not a man more highly praised for his appearance than Absalom. From the top of his head to the soles of his feet, there was no blemish in him. So just envision, look at these words. Whenever he used to cut the hair of his head, he used to cut his hair from time to time. When it became too heavy for him, he would weigh it, and the weight was 200 shekels by the royal standard. So here's this picture. That's five pounds of hair. And uh, so I, I, I envision Fabio or Levi Crowley with long hair, is what, is what we're, we're talking about right here. And Absalom was this charismatic, handsome figure Long hair, imagine this Fabio rock star. And he was nasty. He was nasty. He didn't want to wait for his father to kick the bucket, King David, and die before he ascended to the throne. He was going to undermine David. He was going to draw people into this pit of discontent, of grumbling, so that they would want to overthrow David's leadership. And 2 Samuel 15, 6 says, He stole the hearts of the men of Israel. 2 Samuel 15, 12 says that, that Absalom's followers kept on increasing. How'd he do that? He would get up in the morning and he would sit at the city gate. And when people came by, he would say, how you doing? They'd say, fine. He'd say, where are you from? And they'd tell him. And he'd say, oh, I love that place. I've been there. Um, tell, me what, tell me what you don't like about what's going on right now in the nation of Israel. And he would, he would draw out of them complaint and grumbling and pessimism and discontentment. And his followers kept on increasing. And they did. Often when they would want to worship him because he was so charismatic and convincing, he would, he would say, no, I'm just, I'm just a common man. I'm, I'm just like you. And then he would reach down and give him a kiss on the hand. So suave, so debonair, so conniving. And yet, the kiss of Absalom was the kiss of discontentment. It was also the kiss of betrayal. Because when David was finally overthrown, they would find out that Absalom could not deliver on his promises. The spirit of Absalom is alive and well today, the spirit of grumbling. USA Today had an article June 23rd. Look at these words. Opinion expert Everett Ladd says, U.S. satisfaction is very low now, but polling has shown wild swings historically due to many factors, including television. 
Everett Ladd said, the television age produces more volatility and mood swings. It puts the country on an emotional roller coaster. Given the inherent ways it covers national events, it says this is what is important. Here's crisis one, here's crisis two, bang, 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 full color. We have found that a generalized dissatisfaction about certain things remote has been an increasing characteristic of the television age. There's a whole series of measures I call pop cynicism. Now, why do I share that? It's because that was from USA Today, June 23rd, 1992. Way before the 12 hour news cycle and way before social media. You see, social media, the availability of media 24 seven is the new city gate where Absalom sits. And if we don't watch, it can undermine our happiness, our joy, our contentment, our lives. Because see, we undermine our happiness because of the subtle, subversive force of the spirit of Absalom. How many relationships are undermined because of the spirit of Absalom? Where, for example, married partners grumble against one another. They focus on that physical deficiency. They focus on that personality trait. They focus on that inadequacy and they grumble against one another. They fail to encourage one another. And before you know it, the spirit of Absalom has created a spirit of discontent and division. There's an old story about a guy who looked at his wife and he said, Martha, when I was playing football in high school and I got that concussion, there you were comforting me and helping me recover. And Martha, after we got married and I got pneumonia, there you were nursing me back to health. And Martha, when my grandmother died, you were right there beside me the whole time helping me in my grief. And Martha, when I had that operation and I was in the hospital, you nursed me back to health when I came home. Martha, you're just bad luck. And some people are around expressions of love all the time, and yet all they can find is that fault. And it's all about perspective, and it's all the result of the spirit of Absalom. Look at these words that we need so badly as a culture. James 5, 9 says, Do not grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. The Message Bible translates that. Friends, don't complain about each other. A far greater complaint could be lodged against you, you know. The judge is standing around the corner. And in this culture of complaint and grumbling and finding the 2% that's wrong, we really, 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 really need this. I found there are four types of grumblers. There's whiners. Someone once said that whining is anger trying to come out. Whiners are just squeak with whining all the time. There are martyrs who want everyone to, they want a virtue signal. They want everybody to know how much they've sacrificed. And so their grumbling comes from their martyrdom. There are cynics who are so jaded that through, through every experience in life, they're always looking at the negative. And then there's a perfectionist and nothing is ever good enough. And we think this because it's so second nature to us in culture and because it draws headlines and it draws eyeballs to news cycles, and it creates dialogue in social media, we think it's harmless, but it's not. Grumbling is not harmless. Number one, it displeases God. That's one thing, first of all, for those of you who are people of faith who are listening to this and followers of Christ, you need to know very clearly in Scripture, the spirit of Absalom does not make God smile. Matter of fact, when the children of Israel were wandering through the wilderness, they complained, they grumbled against God and against each other. And Numbers 11, 1 says, when the Lord heard their complaining, his anger was aroused. And you know what he did? He opened up the earth and just swallowed some of them. He just said, I had enough of this. Like you, 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 you people are so ungrateful that I'm just going to swallow you up. And Paul would later write about that in 1 Corinthians 10, 9, when he would say, we should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. That happened too. That's enough to make me stop grumbling. 
And do not grumble if some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel who came and just created this earthquake that would swallow up their grumbling. This is an amazing picture of how devastating grumbling is to our relationship with God. Can you imagine the headlines? Grumbling pandemic has now reached one million in casualties. Because it's what it was, it was a pandemic. That's what grumbling always is. It's like a virus that spreads through a family, through an office, through a team, through a school, through a church, through a group, and it displeases God. Number two, grumbling ruins our credibility and influence. It ruins our credibility and influence. If you're a grumbler, if you doubt it, ask the person that you live closest to and with and associate with. But if you're a grumbler, please take the fish bumper stock sticker off your car. Please don't tell anyone you're a Christ follower because nothing undermines influence and the credibility of people of faith like Christ followers who grumble just like everyone else in the office. Evidently, the church at Philippi had a problem with this, and there, so there are references to, to this in the book of Philippians. And in chapter 2, verse 14, he says, Do everything without grumbling or complaining, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. Look at that. He says the, the, the action and the habit of grumbling and complaining can so undermine your influence that you don't stand out in a warped and crooked generation and it can undermine your journey of faith. And so he says, listen, listen. Grumbling undermines your influence. You may think you're just fitting in, but people are looking at you going, well, Bob's no different than everyone else. Betty's no different from everyone else. And he says, you want to stand out? You be the one in the office who doesn't participate in that stuff. You be the one who finds something positive to say about your coworkers, about your family members, about your neighbors, when everyone else is whining and grumbling. And number three, grumbling destroys our peace. Maybe this is the most devastating reality of grumbling that we feel eventually. And that is grumbling, we now know, literally has a detrimental effect upon your emotions, upon your physical conditioning, upon your attitude and how you see life. Proverbs 17, 22 says, a cheerful heart does good like medicine. We know now that is literally true. People who tend to, even, even when there's some negativity, there are some problems that have to be evaluated, even when that's the case, they can still be positive, they can still be a cheerful heart. Because you see, being a non-grumbler is not, oh, be a Pollyanna, just walk around with, with rose-colored lenses on, uh, every day is lollipops and hip-hop happy day, but don't ever see the problems. That's, that's not what it means to be a non-grumbler. There's a guy who was being checked into a nursing home and four elderly women were noticing the new guy. And the first one said, um, you're new here, are you not? And, uh, he said, yeah, I am. And the second one said, well, where have you been? He says, well, I've been at San Quentin Prison for the last 20 years. And the third one said, well, why were you at San Quentin that long? He said, well, because I murdered my wife. And the fourth one said, well, I guess that means you're single then, doesn't it? You got to identify the problems. You can't walk around and see, you know, there's positive in everything. There's not but you do have a positive perspective and that does good like medicine. It literally has an effect upon your body and your spirit. Billy Graham used to tell about a woman who was 106 years old who went in for her annual checkup and she was so vibrant, so full of life. And when the, the doctor got done, he says, you're in great shape. Um, and she says, well, that's great to hear. I'll see you next year. And he said, well, what makes you think you're going to be around next year? And she said, well, you know, I've done some research and not very many people die between 106 and 107. And it's usually that person with that kind of attitude who lives longer. And if they don't live longer, 
They live better. They live better. Psalm 77, 3 says, I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. You have a grumbling and complaint threshold. Do you know that? Where it starts building up in your emotional, physical makeup. And you're going to have to decide whether you're going to focus on your spouse, on your children, on your parents, on your neighbors, on your small group, on your church, on your country's faults, or not. There's an old parable about a farmer who just started complaining about everything on his farm. Till finally, it, like many of us, it devolved into, he decided, I'm going to sell this dump. And he hired a realtor, and a realtor put together an advertisement for his property. And the advertisement talked about the beautiful lake and the well-kept buildings, the lush pasture, the rolling meadows, the contemporary house. And the farmer read that advertisement and he called up the realtor and he says, you know what, I've been looking for a place like that all my life, take it off the market. So often, it's not about the three, five percent of our life that is not right. It's about our attitude. And if you're listening to this and you're thinking, but COVID has taken away so much that I like, then you need this. You need this because being a non-grumbler is not being a person with perfect circumstances or circumstances according to my ideals. Being a grumbler is being able to see your assets for what they are. When we grumble, our greatest assets wind up sounding like liabilities. That's what happens. The very farm that we've wanted all of our life ends up being the place that we pick and we grumble about and to others about. So look at that verse again. Paul says, do everything without grumbling or complaining. The emphasis there is on a comprehensive way of living. He's not even saying 99% of the time don't grumble, but you have some exemptions like when there's COVID. The literal rendering of that, everything is the first word in the original language. It literally reads, all things in those don't grumble or complain. So look at that again. Do everything without grumbling or complaining. If you get nothing else from this, take that away. That if you don't watch it, you'll begin to focus upon the 3 to 5 to 10% of your life that's not good. And you miss the 90%, the 95%, the 98% that God has given you. Somewhere along the line, we Americans are going to enjoy life. We've got to, in spite of COVID-19, we've got to trust the wisdom of what Paul said from a jail cell in, in Philippi. Philippians 4. Verse 4 and verse 8, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say it, rejoice. Whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy about your spouse, about your house, about your car, about your children, about your family, about your church, about your company, think about these things. <laughs> truth I'm proof you'll find it there you gotta serve something ain't that right I know it gets dark but there's always a light don't gotta buy in to get into the club so trade your worries 
Gotta show up if you wanna be seen If it matters to you, ma, it matters to me I'm gonna fall hard, yeah, I know I am The clowns crack up, I laugh with them Ain't no man can't save me, yeah.